Welcome to today's topic on implementing auto layout programmatically. We are going to learn how to implement constraints and size classes through code instead of storyboard. We will be covering the following different things today. Firstly, we will deal with the reasons why we would want to implement auto layout programmatically. Secondly, we will look at the different options available to help us achieve this. And lastly, we will look at these different options in greater detail. Before we get started, let me talk about some of the resources you can use to get a better understanding of the concepts. This video will be part of a blog that I have written on, on this topic. You can find the link to the blog in the comments of this video. The blog covers different aspects of what we are going to talk about in a slightly theoretical manner. You may have come across this video on the blog itself. Other than the video and the blog, there is a GitHub repository for the different implementations of programmatic constraints. I have also provided a starter project for you to try the different implementations yourself. There are some things that you should be familiar with before we get started. First, you should know how to create apps without storyboard. Second, you should be comfortable with Swift. Here is a link to an article I've written on how to create apps without storyboard. Now, let us look at how we can implement auto layout programmatically. The first question that would come to any developer's mind is, why would I need to implement auto layout programmatically? This is a valid question. It is very easy to implement auto layout via storyboard, and it works well. However, there are some situations where this won't be possible or may not be easy to implement. For example, if the app is implemented programmatically, or if we are creating UI components on the fly, or even if we need to create constraints to change on the fly depending on certain conditions. By conditions, I mean criteria including and beyond size classes. So if we have to implement it, it program, programmatically, then what options do we have? There are multiple approaches available each with its own set of advantages and disadvantages. We will be looking at the approaches in detail later in the video. First, let us look at the options available. The first approach is to write code with generic values for sizing. The second approach is to use layout anchors to hook UI elements to each other and thus create constraints. The third approach is to create constraints by creating the NS layout constraint object. The fourth approach is to describe constraints using the visual format language. The fifth approach is to use stack views and avoid using constraints altogether. Of course, in reality, we will be using a medley of all approaches. Let us look at each approach one by one. The first and most straightforward approach is to use generic sizing information. We normally create frames, points, and other sizes by providing explicit values when creating CG rect, CG float, CG size, and so on. Instead of providing the explicit size, we will calculate the values based on the device type. So if, for example, we are creating a point with two values, x and y, we provide a formula with a scaling factor. Here is an example. We are specifying the frame for the view app title using the CG rect init method. It takes four arguments. The upper left-hand corner xy coordinates, along with the width and height. The values for all these elements are provided indirectly. 
let us examine each argument. First, we are saying that x should be 10 points away from the x of the superviews origin. y must be aligned 30 points away from the y of the superviews origin. The width must be 20 points less than the width of the superview. And finally, the height must be 5% of the superview's height. As we can see, that the frame size is written in a generic indirect manner. If the size and location of the superview changes, then the size and location of app title will also change accordingly. Here is a more common approach. The constants we use to create the sizing elements are multiplied by a scaling factor. Unlike the previous example, where the constants are the same for all screen sizes, the scaling factor itself is de determined based on the screen size. This approach of writing generic code allows us to write code that can work on a variety of screen sizes. However, the complexity can go up very quickly if we want variations on the scaling factor and support for multiple screen sizes, along with orientations. There will be a lot of blue code that we would have to write to get the correct scaling factor for each situation. One of the easier ways of achieving auto layout is with the help of UI stack views. These were introduced in iOS 9 and it allows us to stack up views vertically or horizontally. By combining different orientations, we can achieve fairly complex designs easily. Stacks have a few settings that let us easily lay out the views inside. Let us quickly go over those before we jump into the implementation details. Spacing is a setting that allows us to specify the space between all the views in a stack view. The distribution determines the way the area within the view is utilized. Is it to be filled up or aligned to one side? The alignment specifies the vertical positioning of the views on the screen. The combination of all these three attributes together helps us lay out the views the way we want. Creating a stack view is very easy. Simply create the object, allocate memory for it, and you're ready. It is also a good idea to create another variable for the stack spacing. Now that we have the UI stack view object, we can configure it accordingly. The axis, distribution, alignment, and spacing are properties that can be configured the way we want. We then need to add the views in the correct sequence to the stack view. Once we are done, simply add the stack view to the super view. Using stack views is very easy. However, they alone are almost always never enough to achieve auto layout. Layout anchors are one way of applying constraints. All the views have anchor properties that can be constrained. The constraints can be with respect to other views or just standalone constraints. Layout anchors are very easy to use and can be mapped with the way we apply constraints on Storyboard. Here is an example of how a constraint would be applied using layout anchors. Let us break it down and analyze it bit by bit. The first item is the view on which we want to apply the constraints, in this case, app title. Second is the size property to which we want to apply the constraint. In this case, we are placing a constraint on the width of the view. The third element is the constraint method. In this case, the constraint method takes two properties. The first one is a reference to the target view, specifically its width anchor. At the same time, we mention the relationship, greater than or equal to. So we are saying that the app title's width must be greater than or equal to the icon's width. Second argument is the relationship of a multiplier. 
this relationship has a multiplication factor of 4. Finally, the constraint object returned by this function must be activated. The constraint won't be applied till this is done. So that's the complete statement. First, just to recap, the first, the object we want to apply constraints on, the second element, the target object's dimensions on which we want to apply the constraint. The third element is the constraint action. The fourth element is the condition that defines the constraint. The fifth element is the dimension which will form the reference for the constraint. The sixth one is the multiplication factor. And the seventh one is the activation of the constraint. Here is another example. The name field views width must be greater than or equal to 100. Activate the constraint. Again, the same as before. The object we want to apply constraints on, the target object's dimension, constraint action, the condition, and activation of the constraint. If we want to set the compression resistance of the view, there is a function for that. Let us examine the statement. The service label, which is the view on which we want to set the compression resistance, the function call to set the compression resistance priority, the priority level, and the direction in which we want to set the priority. So four components, the object on which we want to apply the constraint, the action of setting compression resistance, the level of priority level for the compression resistance, and the direction in which it should be applied. Similarly, we can set the content hugging priority. The view on which we want to set the content hugging priority, in this case, title stack. The function to set the content hugging priority, the priority value, the direction on which the content hugging is to be set. The NS Layout Constraints class describes the constraints programmatically. We can use the init method to manually create this class or use class level function to implement constraints using visual format language. We will look at how to create constraints using visual format language later in the video. The advantage with creating constraints using NS layout constraint class init method is the fact that we can directly implement it like an equation, quite similar to the equation we get when we implement auto layout on storyboard. The drawback is the fact that each and every value in the init method must be provided even if it is not being used. This means that there is a lot of boilerplate code that we do not need and therefore adds to the confusion. It also has limits on the kind of constraints that can be applied. Here is an example of a constraint created using the init method. The first argument is the view on which we want to play, apply the constraint. The second argument is the attribute on which we specific, specifically want to apply the constraint. In this case, the trailing edge. The third argument is the relationship of the constraint. In this case, they're equal. The fourth argument is the reference view to which the constraint is to be applied. For example, the super view. The fifth argument is the attribute which we want to target specifically. We want to target the trailing edge of the superview. The sixth argument is the multiplier for the expression. And finally, the seventh argument is the constant value that we may want to apply to the expression. All these items are necessary even if they're not required. So in this case, we are placing constraints saying that the trailing edge of list must be equal to the trailing edge of the super view with a constant shift of 10 points. The last option, of course, is to use visual format language. Unlike the other approaches we have seen so far, visual format language makes use of ASCII-like artwork to describe constraints. This makes the whole process easy to visualize and compare. 
The advantages are quite straightforward. It is easier to read the error messages in console because they are in a similar format. We can create multiple constraints in a single line. We can only create valid constraints. Of course, there are some drawbacks too. We cannot apply any kind of constraint that we wish. Also, there is no validation of the constraint until runtime. This means there will be repeated runs of the code to fix any issue for each and every constraint that we create. This is how the visual format language structure looks. Let us examine it in detail. First, we have the orientation. This is the direction in which we are describing the constraints. Then we have the superview along with the connection to the superview. Next, we mentioned the first view in the sequence. We may or may not have a connection to another view. Lastly, we have a trailing connection to the superview. And of course, there are some components that are not required. And some components that may appear zero or more times. Here are some available symbols. We will be looking at these through some examples momentarily. Here's one example. We want two labels to have a horizontal spacing of 100 between them. The text in blue indicates how the VFL string would look. First, we have the label with the square brackets around it. In this case, the label is a, a string reference to the view, the first view in the sequence, followed by a spacing of 100 points, followed by the next view in the sequence, which is text field, which is specified within square brackets. Next, we will look at a constraint for a label with a minimum size of 100. We start off with the label within the brackets, along with the size condition of greater than or equal to 100 within round brackets. Let us look at a more complex set of constraints. First, we have the horizontal direction indicated by the letter H. Then we have the super view indicated by the vertical bar, followed by the standard spacing with a spacing value of 100 points. Next, we have our first view, which is a label within square brackets, followed by another spacing of 100 points, and then the trailing edge of the super view. If we do not want any spacing between views, then we simply remove the spacing symbol. In this case, the light green label and dark green label are flush to each other. So there is no need for spacing information in between. To set the width of two views to be equal, we start by mentioning the first view within brackets, square brackets, along with the equals equals operator, followed by the name of the second view. This is within round brackets. And all this is, of course, within square brackets of the first view. Let us go the other way around. Let us build the VFL string for this example. Let us start in the horizontal direction. So we need the letter H, followed by the super view, which is the leading edge of the super view, followed by a spacing of 30. Then we have the first view in the sequence, which is a label within square brackets. Then we have another spacing of 100 points, followed by the slider view within square brackets, followed by spacing of 50 points. Then the last view, which is the text field within square brackets. In the end, we have a spacing of 30, ending with the trailing edge of the super view. Here is another example of a visual format language string in the vertical direction. See if you can visualize how the views would appear.
Here is a more elaborate example. We first have the horizontal direction, followed by the super view, a standard spacing, followed by the logo view, whose width is equal to the width of logo title, followed by a spacing of 10, followed by the heading label, whose width must be 100 with a priority of 250, followed by a spacing of 20 with a priority of 750. Then we have a transaction date label whose view must be greater than or equal to 50 points, followed by a standard spacing, and then the trailing edge of the super view. We have seen how we can build visual format language strings. Now, let us look at how we can apply this in code. We will need two things. A variable that holds all the constraints we create. This will be an array. And we will need a dictionary that will allow us to map views to a string equivalent of the view name. This is called as a view map. We will see why we need the view map momentarily. Now we will create the constraint using the NSLayout constraints class constraints method and provide the visual format string. This is where the view map comes in handy. This method will use the view map to take the view mentioned in the string and get its programmatic reference via the map. We add the constraints created into an array. Once we are done creating all the constraints, we will activate them together with the help of the activate method. Here are some more examples of constraints being created in the horizontal direction. The only thing left is the process of handling size classes. To handle size classes, we need to override the trait collection did change function. This allows us to handle different traits. Let us look at some code to see how this works. Simply override the trait collection did change function. Write down the code for checking the different size classes available. For example, whether it's compact or regular uh, in the vertical or horizontal directions. You can have all combinations that you need. The variation could be based on device type too. For example, is it an iPad? Is it a phone? Is it an Apple TV? Is it a CarPlay device? We can even add variations based on device features. For example, does it have force touch capability? Uh, what's the display resolution size available? Handling size classes is fairly simple and straightforward. Now that we've seen all different approaches, we get a better idea of how we can implement auto layout programmatically. Of course, as you must have guessed, we will have to combine multiple approaches to get more precise results. That also helps us get more accurate implementations of our UI. If we had to compare the different approaches, and this is based, this will vary on, you know, based on everyone's experience. But I've tried to compare based on complexity, flexibility, compactness of code, and variety of constraints. When it comes to complexity, the generic code layout anchors and NS layout constraints do not provide a very high level of complexity. But when it comes to visual format language, it's fairly high. When it comes to flexibility, generic code and layout anchors are fairly flexible, whereas the NS layout constraint class init method is not flexible at all. And visual format language is moderately flexible. Compactness of code, well, generic code is of the lot the least compact. Layout anchors, and visual format language both tend to produce fairly compact code. Even the NS layout constraint init method approach produces moderately compact code. When it comes to a variety of constraints, you have a large variety possible using the generic code and layout anchors approach. 
but not a big variety available through the init method of NSLayoutConstraints class. Even visual format language has some limitations. I have not mentioned UI stack views in this, and the reason for that is you will probably be using UI stack views along with one of these approaches. In summary, ask yourself if you really need to implement auto layout programmatically. You will need to analyze your UI and choose the right approach. This will probably be a combination of the approaches we have covered above. I hope you've liked this video. For more information, you can read the article written in our blog.